Priscilla. I will be the instructor for today's class. Um, today's class is how to get started with Embroidery Studio E3. In today's class, I'm going to cover the screen layout, opening existing designs, Adding lettering, fonts, you know, working with the fonts, um, size, and the various baselines. Connectors and trims. Color changes. Centering a design. Finding the hoop. Saving a design as an EMB first. Making a stitch file or a sew file to sew on your embroidery machine. And then we will open it up for questions and answers. All of you have been muted and will um, be muted during, during the class. Once I've covered the material that you're seeing on the screen, I will go ahead and unmute everyone and we will have, um, we will have a question and answer session. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So now that you have your Wilcom E3 loaded, what is it that you do? Once you load your software on your, on your desktop, the software is going to generate a shortcut key that looks like this icon that I have at the top of the screen. So you double click it, you open your screen, and you get what we have here below. Many people ask, what do I do now? Where should I start? So that's what we're going to cover in today's class. All of you should be seeing my Embroidery Studio E3 class or er, screen. And this is the screen that all of you see when you first double click the ES icon and open up your Embroidery Studio. First thing you see a new from template. To go over this real quickly before we go into the screen layout, what the new from template does or will do for you is if you want to use our auto fabric assistant, it does default to on. Maybe you're new to embroidery, you're not really quite sure what underlay, what densities, what backing, what topping to use for a particular fabric. We assist you with that with our auto, our auto fabric assistant. There's various fabrics that you can select based on what it is that you're going to be sewing. And then it also tells you the required stabilizers, um, the topping, if any, a backing. And then you can also select your machine format from here. Now we're going to, we'll come back to this because uh, I want to go over the screen layout just so that you're all aware of where things are um, once you get into your embroidery studio. But once you choose your fabric assistant, if that is what you want to do, then you would just click OK, and it brings you to what I call our working screen. So just a couple things as we're um, looking at my Embroidery Studio screen. We all see this red, red square, red cross here on the screen. I'd like to point out to all of you that that is zero, 00 on this working pane or, or this sewing field that we see here. If you notice, the red square is lined up with a zero on the horizontal ruler and zero on the vertical ruler. Once your design is done, this is not zero, zero or center of your design. It's only the center of the working page. So if your design ends up in the upper right hand corner, don't worry about this red crosshair because the white crosshair and we'll go over all of this um, when we start centering our design, is what you want to look at when you're working with embroidery. So having said that, here what we have is um, the Embroidery Studio, the Embroidery Studio screen. We have pull-downs 
across the top. So we've got File, Edit, View, so on and so forth. And it's a little bit different from those of you that may have come over from E2 or even E1.5. These have changed. It changed it more along. Um, you need to think of, okay, if I'm going to do something to my design, I need to go to the design pull, pull down. If I'm doing something to an object, I need the object pull down. Maybe I'm working with functions, stitches, like bitmaps. So again, it's more what is it that I'm going to do to what I have on the screen, and that's kind of how you use um, the pull downs. Below that, I'm just going to so you can all see it, is our CorelDRAW interaction button. No longer called the universal toolbar. It's the CorelDRAW interaction button. Um, I'm moving this around because I want to let you know that any of these toolbars that you have on the screen, you can move them, place them wherever you like. So just because they default to the left, it defaults over here to the left hand side. And if you don't like it there, you don't need to keep it there. If you closely look at the left-hand side of any of these um, toolbars, there's some dotted lines on the left-hand side. If I hover my mouse, mouse over them, I get um, the icon changes to the four arrows, so it allows me to move this wherever I would like on the screen. I'm just going to grab it and move. There's going to be toolbars that might show up on, on your system or you inadvertently turned them on. You don't use them all the time. You want to make some room. Just We can move them and we can also close them. So if we, to close them, we're just going to click the X. Now what happens if I inadvertently close a toolbar and I I can't find it. If I come over to Window and go to Toolbars, all the toolbars available to me within my um, my software, so meaning the elements that you may have purchased, are going to display here. So any of the ones that have a check mark are the ones that are being displayed at this time. I went ahead and as I was showing you stuff. Um, turned off, no, I can't remember which one I turned off. But I'm going to go ahead and just right-click on Function, and that gets turned on. Right-click on Sequence. Because I'm right-clicking, it's pulling up my mm -hmm. toolbars. Now, if you look here, I have those toolbars. I'm not going to use my shift so I'm going to close that. I'm going to close my chenille. Um, if I am a sequin person, once the sequin toolbar gets displayed on my screen, I can, I can move it wherever I want. To the left-hand side of my screen is my main toolbar. So that's where I'm going to find my select object, my reshape. Um, the different digitizing methods, my lettering tool, very important to know where that is. And on the right-hand side of my screen, we have flyouts. Right now, mine are locked in place. So I've got object properties and color object list locked on my screen. So I want to give myself a little bit more room as I work with designs. This little um, um, thumbnail or push pin, if I click on it, it's the auto hide, and I move it to the left, notice how it's, it's hidden itself over to the far right hand side of my screen, offering me a little bit more room on my working screen, or really my sewing area. So if I just click on this, it flies out. I'm going to just close a couple of these things that we're not going to cover. A lot of this is just advanced, advanced features. 
Just down at the bottom is my color palette. These um, are display colors. They can also be, they're also your color changes. So this is where you're going to assign colors to different objects or um, different objects or lettering or monogramming that you create with the software. Right now, if I look at this, I have 56 colors. I can go ahead and I can minus out by clicking this green minus sign colors that may be extraneous to me. So if I needed, if I went too far and I needed to add five more, I could, add, I could click on the plus sign. At the bottom right hand corner, I see stretch cherry toweling. Remember, when we went File and New from Template, I selected the Stretch Cherry Toweling. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn off my Auto Fabric Assistant, and I'm going to click OK. Hey. Now, I did that for two reasons. I wanted to show you how you can open up a window where you as the digitizer can put in your densities, your pull compensation, your underlay. So you would turn off the auto fabric assistant. But I also wanted to call attention to the fact that these, these colors that I had minused out are now back. When you open up a new window or you go new from template, in the background, it's opening up our normal template. The normal template is basically the environment that I see here. So many of you call our support line and ask, you know, how can I overwrite those settings? Maybe you want your color palette down below, your color palette down below to match your thread stand. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to minus this out once again. So now I have 15 colors, and I'm going to go ahead and click on the color palette editor. I'm going to change the colors in my color palette. So right now, I'm working with colorway one. I'm going to double click the blue, and I'm going to make the blue black. And if I wanted to, um, I could change the description of the color here too, and then click next. I'll make this one red. Um, due to time constraints, I'm just going to leave it as cyan. You would just type this, you know, delete out cyan and type in red. Let's make this orange. I'm just clicking Next. Now, I could click on more colors. So if I had a very specific red or a specific, you know, um, maybe pink, I could mix my colors here. I'm just going to go ahead and click OK. I could also bring in a thread chart. So maybe I'm a Madeira mm -hmm. user pulls in all the Madeira colors. And I could assign the Madeira 1800, which is black, to my first color. So it's selected here in the thread chart. I'm going to hit Assign. And then notice it automatically goes to the next one. Maybe I use their, I don't know, 1637 red. I'm going to go ahead and assign it. And you could follow through and do the to fill in your 15 colors. That's the color palette editor. So as we move forward on what we do with, em with Embroidery Studio, um, when we first load it, we can set up our working screen or our environment to suit our needs. So once I make all these changes and I've matched colors here to my thread stand, how do I save this for future use? Once you've set everything up the way you like it, you can go to File, Save As, and remember, we've been talking about templates. So we're going to change the Save As type or the type of file that we're saving to will come in the template. And I have a lot of them on your system. You would just see um, blow them like normal EMT shift leads. 
one we want to overwrite, or if you go back to your systems um, after class and play around with this, you're going to select normal EMT, click save, it asks you that it, it's going to tell you it already exists, and you're going to replace that. So now, if I click new, notice that my screen looks exactly the way I set it up and overwrote that template. Now there's more that you can do to that template as you get more custom to Embroidery Studio if there's a particular font that you use over and over again or maybe it's the only font that you offer, you can actually um, save that in your template. So you would just you know, select your font and then go through the process process of overwriting your template. Whoops. So that's a little bit about the screen layout. Um, your stitches show up here. Different um, things that you can do to, to the stitches, different effects in this area. Over to the far right, would be your your dimensions, your design width and height dimensions. For those of you that possibly came from 1.5 over to 3.0, we now have a little lock button. I've been looking for that for years. So if I say that my design needs to be 5 inches, if my lock button is turned on, it will proportionally resize the height of it as well. So that's a really cool feature. All right, so now that we know a little bit about the layout of our screen, What's the first thing we are probably going to do? If we have been in this industry or maybe we've got stock designs, the first thing we might need to do is open up an existing design, maybe add some lettering to it, you know, assign some color changes, um, find a hoop for it, and sew it off. That's basically what I'm going to do in class today. And then, you know, we'll, if you have any questions on just this basic stuff, we'll open it up, as I said, for questions and answers um, at the end of class. The open command is found in file, open. As with most of software packages, if there is a keyboard shortcut, it will be shown to the far right of the command. And if it has an icon associated with it, you'll also see that to the left. I'm kind of a keyboard shortcut person, so a lot of times I will just start hitting the key to activate things. I'm going to try to remember as I go through class that if I do something that you can't see, um, like press a key on the keyboard, that I do bring that to your attention. So let's go ahead and open up a file. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring in an existing design. It's going to be a DSD, probably one of the most common stitch files out there. And we are going to add some text to it. So let me go to um, my existing design folder. And in my existing design store, I have an EMB file. And but what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to open up a DST. So when you're in the open command, down at the bottom of the open dialog box, you have types of files. So what files this will come open? If we drop this list down, anything that I hear will come is going to read. One thing that will come does not read, with the exception of the Malco Condensed, are native files to other digitizing programs. So if you're coming over from, you know, from a, a competitor's product over to Wilcom, we do not read their native file. You would have to convert your designs to a format that we read. Um, we do recommend converting them to DST. It is a very simple stitch file that we read, if you're coming over from like a CompuCon 
program. CompuCon creates, when it saves its data file, it saves an XXX file. So those of you, you know, if you are an old CompuCon user and have a lot of files, you wouldn't even have to do a conversion because you can filter out XXX and open those up. Let's go ahead and just select my Tajima. And I'm going to select my hockey stick design. And I'm going to go ahead and click open. Now, in the background, this is a small design, so you don't really see it. Um, it's processing the design. So it's basically taking it through Wilcom's patented stitch processor. And it's converting those stitches over to outlines. Now, just a quick word of caution on the outlines. What the outline allows you to do when it converts it over is it allows you to change stitch types to add underlay, to um, you know, change colors to an object. So an object basically retains all the information needed to embroider that file. Stitch type, density, color change, does it have a trim, um, pull compensation, etc. It also allows you to edit the notes. Now where I want you to cut where I want you to caution you is that when it goes through the processor, it, you know, something may have been done in a complex spill or um, in a previous version, but it may not necessarily come in as a complex spill because of the way the processor works, but it will allow you to go in ahead and reshape nodes. See, like I could take these nodes and move them out. So it's more of an editing technique, but any stitch that you bring in, or any stitch file that you bring in, you can reshape it. When you're reshaping or editing, you be kind of digitizing too, because these are the nodes that are creating this particular shape. Now what I did was I hit, um, I hit B on the keyboard. B is a quick, quick key for a magnifying glass. Shift C um, and zooms it a little bit. So even though I'm editing, I can move points around. Undo is the blue arrow at the top of the screen. So I'm going to undo those couple of changes. Okay, so I have my hockey sticks on my screen. Um, maybe I need to make them just slightly larger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my embroidery design. The quickest way to do that is Control and A on the keyboard. It takes everything on the screen. And if you look to the upper left-hand corner of my screen, it's telling, giving me the width and the height of my design. Now, it is set in metric. If I am not a metric person, I can change that to inches. And I think that might be the toolbar that I had. So let me go back over to my toolbar and I do it on a range. So here I go again, turning them on. Ah, and here it is. It's view. So I use that one a lot. I'm going to leave that there. Pull my other stuff out. If you notice in the view, and I'm going to move it down here so we can see it, it says metric here. This is my design measurement system for my software at the moment. So if I don't want to measure metric, I can just drop this down to U.S. And now anything that is desirated will show up in U.S. measurement of inches. You're still going to see things in metric, and those are properties that are associated with the machine. So your densities, your pull compensation, things of that nature. So let's just say um, the height of my hockey stick needs to be 2 inches. I'm going to type in 2. Real quick, at the bottom left-hand corner, see where I am bottom left, we see 1131? That's the current stitch count of my design. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in 2 and press Enter. It's made the design larger, and it's also increased the stitches. Remember, it's increased the stitches because I've taken it through the processor. I've taken the DST file. 
I have made it, <clears throat> I've converted it to objects, so when I change the size, it regenerates the entire embroidery design, either increasing or reducing the number of stitches. Okay, so the next thing I want to do to my design is I want to add some lettering. The lettering is, the lettering icon is over to the left hand side. There's different ways that you can put letters on the screen. The quickest and most efficient way that I believe um, The quickest and efficient way for the lettering tool, in my opinion, is to right-click on it. Brings you up right to the object properties of the lettering box. And really, what you do is you just go from the top to the bottom and back to the top to create the text. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to type in hockey. And I'm going to put in the year, 2013. I'm going to select the font. Now, if you notice, it gives me the name of the font, <coughs> the text that I have typed into the right, and it does show me what this particular font is going to look like. The little red zigzag stitch icon to the far left is telling us that this is a Wilcon digitized font. If I scroll down to the bottom, I'm also going to see font with TT to the left of them. Those are two type fonts. Those are going to differ computer to computer. So you may have different ones than I have on my system. It's all based on the different softwares that we load different fonts that we download. So we can also use true type fonts. The true type font will only you know, convert the, the characters that we've typed in. Let me go ahead and I'm going to choose Flash. I'm seeing the text that I typed in in the particular font because I've preview turned on. If you go back to your system and you don't see what I just showed you on my screen, it's a possibility because something is not turned on or you know you may not have one of the elements. My system is full with all the elements available to us. So if I if the preview is off, this is what your screen would look like. So let's just go ahead and click preview. I scroll down just a bit. Here's the height. This is my letters. It does default to about a, a, to a little less than a quarter of an inch. I'm going to go ahead and make my letters a half an inch. The width, I'm going to leave at 100%. And the italics, I'm also going to leave at zero. I'm not going to make a change to that. These are things that you can, you, know, you can play around with as you practice with the software. Below that are the baselines. It my system is defaulted to a free baseline. We also have a fixed line, so maybe you have text that needs to fit within a fixed measurement, maybe three, million, um, three inches. You would use fixed line. And how do you tell the difference between the free line and the fixed line? Notice that the baseline icon for fixed line has a start and an end point. So it's telling us it's going to fit right between my start and my end point. Whereas the free line, it's free. It's going to take um, the number of characters, the height, and the software is going to calculate how long that object is going to be. Those of you that need to arc text, it's on this particular baseline. So why don't we go ahead and just arc this text. I'm going to go ahead and arc it. And because I am already at what I'm going to do is I'm going to take up the 2013. And um, moving down below, I've got the justification as center. And that's what it defaults to. And then the spacing. So if you look here, the letter spacing, it's 10% of the height, or 5 hundredths of an inch. This is kind of going to become important when we talk about trims. So I'm going to leave all of this as is. Um, if you're ever in question about something, 
I always recommend leaving everything at the default value, especially if you're new. There's been a lot of time and energy and development done to our product, so I feel that our defaults are the best out there. So if you're ever in doubt, just leave it at the default, and then you can always go back and tweak. All right, so go ahead. I worked all the way down. I typed in my text, selected my font, my height, my baseline, and now I'm going to click text. And if we always look at the bottom of your corner of our screen in the prompt line, the software is going to tell us what to do, what we need to do. I'm going to enter the start point of the arc, the end point of the arc, and then the third point is going to be um, the arc. Looks like a jump rope. You can place it wherever you want. And then when I put in that third point, it puts it puts my text on the screen. So now the text is automatically selected. I can move it wherever I want. I can scale it up or down with the nodes. I can change the arc with the reshape tool. I'm grabbing the um, the blue square at the bottom to tighten it up. I can move them along the baseline. Maybe I don't like this font. With it selected, I can come to the object properties again. And maybe it's a little too fancy for something that's art. So let me just go ahead and select black two. Much better. Make a little bit smaller. And then let's go ahead and put in the year. Oops, sorry, hit my mouse. Something else flew out. So we're going to do 2013, 2014. And I'm going to select block again. But I, you know, I could select maybe uh, this particular one, which is a serif. Let's make this just slightly smaller. And this time it's an arc, I'm going to do a line. Leaving everything else like this, I'm going to click Create Text. Look at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. It does always prompt you as to what you need to do next. And right here, I'm going to left-click. Puts in the date of my season. I can move around. If um, you need to nudge something when something's selected, your arrow keys on your keyboard slightly nudge things. I'm clicking my left arrow key, like right side of the keypad, just to nudge things over. And there's my design. Now, let's talk about color changes. So I brought in a stock design that had two colors. <coughs> and actually, when I added the text, the hockey and the, and the date, or the year, those objects took the color of the last, um, the last color in the design. So let's say that this design needs a third color. How do I make a color change? I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to click Hockey. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the green. And I'm going to select 2013-2014 and do the same. Now let me just go ahead and do that again. So I selected each object individually. If I select Hockey, hold down my control key, and then select the date down below, it selects both of them, and I can assign the color change that way. So any object in the design can be assigned a different color change. So even my, my stack design, I just said this to be the same color, or to be a fifth color, or a fourth color, sorry. I'm going to go ahead and undo that because I don't think we want the hockey sticks to be pink right now. So let's select this and this. Let's make them green. 
I'm going to come over to the color object list. So how do we know this design shows itself? The color object list shows us a lot of different things about our design. It shows us the color sequence, so the black shows first, then the red, then the green. It also shows us the different objects in the design. It allows us to select those objects. Notice how if I click on the color object list, it's selected here and it's selected there. What if customers said they didn't want like the inside satin stitches of the hockey stick? We could delete those. Probably easier to select those inside pieces. Here, I'm holding down the control key because there's numerous pieces. Once they're selected, I could press delete. Go ahead and delete this. Oops, I want to delete that. Let me go back to the color object list. So in essence, it's all the black I'm going to select. So I was selecting, you know, pieces of parts. I could have simply just selected the color, the black color in the color object list, and then press delete. Let me just go ahead and undo this and bring my design back to where it was. So again, the color object list, color sequence, different objects you can select. I can um, resequence stuff. Maybe I want on hockey. Hockey right now shows as the second last object of the design. The way you build the design is the way it's going to sew. So remember, I brought in my existing design first, so that's going to sew first, and then the text that I dropped in. But what if I want hockey? I want the text to sew first. I can select the text here and drag it to the top. Now hockey is going to sew first and then the black. Or I can also resequence by right-clicking and selecting by number and telling it to sew after. I would need to know the object, so let's go see what it is. So object 23. So again, there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing within our software. Okay, so we've brought in the stack design, we've added text, um, we've inserted color changes. Now what about trims? Right now I'm in what we call TrueView. The TrueView icon is over to the far left-hand side under the X and Y value. So if I click on it, it gives me kind of like a line art drawing. And two to the left of the little fish is show connectors. So I'm going to click on show connectors. And if you take a look at the screen, you see a bunch of perforated lines running through the design. You see triangles with perforated designs. You see um, lines between objects. A perforated line denotes a jump. A triangle is a trim so between the H and the O. There is a trim that has automatically been generated. But in the 2013, if you look real close, there are no trims. There's no triangles, and it's a solid line. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on this for you. So what if we in 2013, 2014, to trim between each letter? What do we do? Within the Wilcom software, the way trims um, and how things connect between digitized objects or between letters, that's all controlled within our connectors property. Connectors are found in object properties, and they have their own tab. Um, that's how important they are. So when you're in connectors, there's two different types of connectors within our software. There's an after object, and there's an inside object. The after object Telling the software what will it do 
after the object selected. So in this case, lettering is one whole object. What's going to happen after it shows this object? In this case, it's going to jump to the next object, and it's going to trim if the next connector is greater than 2 millimeters. The next object in this case is the end of the design. Okay, so now we're thinking we wanted to change this. I'm using always trim. I have no trims between these numbers. That's because the type of connector that you're working with. Anytime you're working with lettering objects on your screen, those that you've created with our software, that you want to assign, you know, change the way it generates the trims, you need to make the connector type inside object. Now, if we look, the type is a jump. It's still going to jump between the letter, but there is no trim. It's off. So I'm going to go ahead and set it to if next connector is greater than 2 millimeters. And what the software does, now we're seeing triangles. I'm going to really zoom in on this. We're seeing perforated lines. Any time the software sees from the end of one letter or character to the next character, it sees a distance greater than 2 millimeters, it's going to trim. So if I, let's say, came over to special, and now let me zoom out. Hold on. There we go. I used Shift Z on the keyboard to zoom out. Let's say I change my letter spacing to like two percent. I want them to come closer together. So it helps if you select your object. And then I'm pressing Enter. Notice how everything kind of came together. You notice how some of them have triangles and some of them don't. So what's happening here is I brought them all together because I changed the spacing between the characters. But when the software looks ahead, from where this 2 ends to where the 0 starts, it sees less than 2 millimeters, so it doesn't trim. But from the 0 to the 1, it sees a greater disk, you know, more than 2 millimeters, so it does trim. 2 millimeters is our default, and I think it's um, a good default for the letters. Um, you know, if you're working with really small letters, you may not want it to trim. You just may want that machine to just continue sewing through until it's done. So that is connectors and trims. And um, so our design is basically done. But the very last thing we want to do is because we, you know, this design, most designs start and end in the center, or maybe they start at the bottom center, depending on what it is that we're going to be sewing on. So the very last thing we want to do is we want to auto start and end this design. I want it to start and end in the center. So I'm going to go to the auto start and end box. I'm going to apply it. I want it to maintain automatically. I highly recommend that you set this to maintain automatically, those that have ES. Because if you went into this design and you made a change, the software will automatically maintain the auto start and end point based on whatever you have set here. So in this case, I'm going to say we're going to sew this over a shirt pocket. So I'm going to click the bottom center radial button, and I'm going to click OK. And notice that my white crosshair has moved down to the bottom center of this design. Because I have that maintain automatically turned on, let's say, for instance, I need to move the text over here. See where my white crosshair, it's automatically recentering that design or redoing the auto start and end point based on the change that I'm making. Now there is a shortcut key for um, auto start and end. It's right here. Hope everybody can see it. Auto start and end. Anytime you hover over a tool, you can see that in E3 it says press F1. For more help, so you could press F1 on your keyboard. It's going to bring up information on that particular icon. It's a great way to learn the program.
So we've gone ahead and we've centered our design. Um, what about a hoop? Maybe we're not too sure what hoop we should use on our machine. We have an auto hoop feature in our software that if I click on it, in my case, it's going to tell me my list is empty. So I'm going to, it wants to know if I want to add hoops. I'm going to say yes. And then I can add whatever hoops I use. Um, I'm just going to select the bare ends of the machine that I use. I'm just going to select all of them, even though I don't have all of them. Move it over to my hoops and click OK. And I must have, hold on a sec. Oh, turn that off. Go ahead and do this. I have Janome hoops in there, so. Go to my hoops and well, I must have selected all of them without realizing it. Let's move it over here. All right. Okay. All right. So I auto hooped it. I'm a Baroting user. I, I use my software to you know help our customers and things like that. Sometimes. I forget what I put on my system. Anyhow, um, let me just back up. So once you load your hoops into your auto hoop feature, any design, if you click on it, it's going to um, put the hoop that best fits the design. So in this case, it would be my Barrett in 18 centimeter. So once you've done that, we're going to go save our design. You're going to always save your design an EMB design. The EMB is the native format to Wilcom. And this could be your working file. And then you're going to save your SO file. So we're going to go to File, Save As. And depending on what machine you use, the format you use, you would select particular formats. So let's just say Tajima, for instance. Right now, it's being saved to my existing design, to that particular folder on my hard drive. But if you're going to a disk or you're going to a flash stick, then you would drop the list, drop your save-in list down and find, you know, maybe I'm going to a flash stick, select my flash stick, and then save to that. So, you know, disks, flash sticks, you just have to find them in your drop-down list, select them, and then save to that design or to that meal. We go to File, and um, I'm going to go to Print Preview. I can um, you know, print out my production worksheet. It gives me you know, the name of the design, um, the number of stitches, colors. It gives me the color change here. If I go into Options, the Approval Sheet, I click OK, is something that you may want to send your customer. Now, a lot of people call and ask, well, how can I email this to my customer? If you want to email this to your customer because it is a print feature, you would need something. Um, you would need a PDF writer program on your software. The one that we recommend is to PDF. You can download that. You can actually just go out and Google it online. And then once you install it, it actually it becomes, it gets loaded like a printer. Let me just go ahead and close this because I have it on my system. So I would print. And instead of printing to my physical printer, I would select the cute PDF writer, click OK. and it doesn't look like it may not be working on my system. It would make a PDF, and then I can email that PDF, that portable document file, to my customer for approval of the design.
So we've gone over the screen layout. I've showed you how to open up existing designs. File open. You can, you know, if you have stitch files or, you know, it's any format here, it also open up an EMD design. Um, we've talked about lettering. Right clicking brings up the object properties. Oops, I keep hitting my mouse, sorry. Yeah, select my font, my height, create the text. You know, I click on the screen. I can move it wherever I want. I can assign my text or an object. Maybe the anchor needs to be a different color. I can come over here to the, the select tool with the star and draw a box around the objects or object that I want selected. What falls within that box gets selected, and I can change its color. We talked about trims. And the connectors I want. Um, this is pretty small, so maybe I want to trim between the M and the E. Remember, I'm working with the lettering object, so therefore it needs to be set at inside object. And I'm going to tell the software to trim if the next connector is greater than two millimeters. Oh, it's pretty slow. Now it wants to save my PDF. So then you would just name your PDF file. You know, give it a name, hit save. And then you could, that PDF would be wherever you'd saved it, and then you could send it to your customer. And then we're going to center the design. So this time I'm going to go ahead and um, click my shortcut. Possibly. Where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Gone to the center of the design. I'm going to go ahead and find a hoop. This time it's pulled up the 15 centimeter hoop. I'm going to go ahead and save my design as an EMB file. And then my SO file, which is a DST. That is the information that I wanted to cover. Um, I am going to go ahead and unmute you guys in just a second here for any questions. Okay, I've unmuted everyone, I believe. Yes. If anybody has any questions on any of the information. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, does anybody have any questions? Shop make. Well, that sounds just great. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be so much fun. That's going to be our first one, but we're going to have lots of fun. Any questions from anyone out there? 
Wendy, do you have a question? No. It's very difficult to hear you, Wendy. You sound like you're very, very far away. I don't know if you have me on speaker. Oh, okay. Now I'm on headphones. Oh, that's better. Okay, I just wanted to say you did a terrific job. Um, you went oh, thank so, you very much. You, you left time in between each thing for us to think about what you were saying, and that really helped. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that comment. I hope that everybody learned something from my class. Anyone else? I did record the class, so once that becomes available, we will email it to all of you. So you'll be able to access it and review the information um, whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, hope to see you in another one of my classes. Bye-bye.